Welcome everyone. This afternoon, we will be talking about API testing and monitoring. We have a series of wonderful speakers this afternoon. Um, our first one being Melissa Vanderhecht, who is the field CTO at Kong. Melissa's talk this afternoon will deal with API ops. And so we're extremely happy to have her here today. Melissa, you are up. Great. Thanks, Shirley. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa. Super excited to be here, joining from what is a very wet London today. Um, as Shirley said, I'm field CTO at Kong, where I've been for about two years, and I was at MuleSoft for about five years before that. So I've been very much part of defining what an API-first approach means and how to adopt it as well. And there's a trend that I've been seeing recently across all the different companies that I've been working with. And that is that the approaches that we took in the past, even just a couple of years ago, to become API-driven aren't scaling anymore as our landscapes and as our requirements have changed. In fact, most companies I speak with now are actually having to trade off between the delivery speed and the delivery quality of their APIs. And this session is all about that. We're gonna look at how we can automate the API lifecycle with API ops to give you both at scale. So let me start off by welcoming you to Acme, which is a large bank with a sprawling tech landscape. Sure, it sounds familiar. The company's been around for several decades. So they've got a lot of legacy systems and tools, and multiple siloed engineering teams, like everybody. They're going through their digital transformation and their biggest priority at the moment is migrating most of their workloads to the cloud and Kubernetes and adopting more of a consistent API driven approach. In fact, the mortgages team has just identified the next API they need to build. Emily's finished designing it and she's reviewing the spec with her team. They all agree it looks great. So as per their normal process, she sends it off to the API platform team for review and she moves on to her next task. The API platform team owns Acme's API platform as well as the overall architecture around it. They host and they manage the platform on behalf of the rest of Acme with the goal of raising the overall engineering standards of all the teams across the organization. One way they do this, a group of them meet once a week to go through all the new APIs that have been submitted and they check them for standards. Sadly, in this case, Emily's spec isn't approved. Turns out there's this whole set of standards that Emily just doesn't know about. They're probably documented somewhere, but it's not very well communicated and it's definitely not done in a developer-friendly way. So a week after she submits it for review, the platform team reject Emily's spec and it gets pushed back down to her. Now, this is pretty embarrassing for Emily. She's getting called out in front of her peers for not doing a good enough job. And this is also a huge waste of everyone's time. Emily's gonna have to redo her work and the platform team are doing these reviews manually at scheduled intervals. So there's several days wasted even just waiting for that review. And it's not just Emily and the mortgages team that suffers here. Acme's following best practice, and they're using a single API platform for global discovery and reuse across the business. And this means as adoption grows, the platform team needs to support more and more teams across the organization. And then obviously they get more and more APIs coming in for review on top of all the other work that they have to do. So the team ends up being stretched really thin. And rather than spending enough time fully reviewing every API, they end up having to prioritize. Compliance becomes a nightmare and things start to fall through the cracks, which isn't so good for the operations team who are responsible for maintaining the overall IT estate. Enough has actually fallen through the cracks that there's a lot of errors in production. Nothing is guaranteed to be consistent and deployments are pretty painful. In fact, they've refused to deploy new code more than once a week because it causes so much instability. Elsewhere in Acme though, the mobile team operates a little differently. 
Their goal is building rich digital experiences for Acme's customers as a reaction to the mobile only banks that are threatening to displace them. They've been given a lot of freedom so that they can get these applications out as quickly as possible. They're about to release their latest open banking app. And this one is a particularly big deal for Acme because it's the first time that they're exposing actual API endpoints to customers. But having seen the delays getting APIs live elsewhere in Acme, the mobile teams decided to do things their own way and they bypass the API platform team altogether. But they were in such a hurry to go live on time that they just focused on the implementation code and they missed some API best practices. And this means their APIs are inconsistent. They're hard to find, they're hard to access, they're hard to use, and this puts people off, whether that's internal or external consumers. The prospects of this app are much more likely actually now to go to one of the fintech competitors who know how to treat APIs as products, because that's what makes an API consumable. And making matters worse is the fact that someone in the mobile team forgot to secure one of his APIs when he published it. This then got exploited, and Acme detected a data breach affecting 15 million customer accounts. Acme started off with all the right intentions here, but they've ended up trading off between speed and quality of their APIs. And this is what I'm hearing time and time again is the biggest pain point in API adoption today. In fact, I've surveyed hundreds of people over the last few months and consistently 80% of audiences are making this trade off right now. I'm interested to know, actually, stick it in the chat. Uh, are you having to trade off right now and are you having to prioritize speed or are you prioritizing quality? But this problem is where API ops comes in. API ops is the automation of the full API lifecycle, combining DevOps philosophies when it comes to iterative design and continuous testing with GitOps philosophies in terms of the automated declarative deployments. So where before we saw these manual, costly and error prone activities at Acme, we now automate all of it. Let's see what that actually means. We know the API lifecycle, right? This is nothing new. Best practice means we design the API before we build it. Then when it's deployed, we add governance and operational policies to manage it before making it discoverable to consumers in a portal. Then there's all the ongoing operations and this life cycle continues going around until we retire the API. And this is no different with API ops. We're still following best practice, but what you'll see is that the processes we follow at each step and between each step have changed. So at design time, we use a design environment like Kong's open source Insomnia to easily create the API spec, which is typically a Swagger or an OAS document. We also have to create a test suite for that spec. And here we should check several things, like are we getting the responses we expect in certain conditions? What's critical here though, is that the tooling we use gives us instant validation. That's linting of the spec against best practices, the ability to run these tests locally and validate what you're building. As the designer of the API, you need to have self-serve tooling that makes it easy to do the right thing from the beginning, because you don't want to end up like Emily. When you've created the spec and validated it locally, then you push it into Git or whichever version control system you use. And then you raise a pull, re a pull request for this new API. This triggers a governance checkpoint embedded in our pipeline. Before any time is spent building the API, we need to make sure that what's going to be built follows our company standards and is aligned with everything else in the ecosystem. We automatically invoke the API tests that we built earlier and any other governance checks that we may want to include at this stage of the pipeline. For example, are we paginating consistently across many APIs? Like before, there's going to be checks that the platform owners will want to do for every API that Emily and the other API designers won't have awareness of. But unlike before, this is not a manual review. This is now an automatic and therefore instant process. In Kong, we enable this through the open source command line tool, INSO. 
If the spec fails any of those tests, it gets automatically pushed back for more work in the design phase. Emily doesn't have to sit around waiting for a response from the platform team anymore. She just gets this instant automated notification that something has to change. And because this is an automated check embedded in the pipeline and triggered by default when a spec's pushed into Git, it means that we have 100% coverage of these checks for every API that's being designed anywhere in Acme. So we're now consistently catching errors as close to the beginning of the pipeline as possible. And this means that they are much faster and much cheaper to remediate. In fact, it's been estimated that to find and fix a bug now costs 1% of what it would cost in production. When all of these tests eventually pass, then we have this validated spec and we can now progress onto the build phase. And here we build our API in the normal best practice way. We use the spec as the contract to tell us what the API needs to do and what the interface needs to look like. And then we use the tests as we go to validate that the API we're building meets that spec. Again, when the developer commits their code saying it's ready for deployment, a series of automated tests are triggered. We automatically execute the tests that we built at design time again to make sure that the API still meets our best practice. These tests are actually our unit tests, and they'll also make sure that the implementation of our API functions how it should. There'll probably be additional tests that we also want to carry out at this stage, still automatically. If any of those tests fail, we know immediately. We don't deploy the API. We go back and we make the necessary changes until our implementation is how we need it. And we can keep executing these tests for continuous validation of what we're doing. Then when those tests pass, we progress forwards to deployment. And now this is where we start to see more of a GitOps approach, because when this round of automated tests has been passed, we then automatically generate a declarative configuration file for this API. And this is one of the central components of GitOps. It's all about declarative rather than imperative ways of managing deployments. And this is now the modern way of managing infrastructure because it's got so many benefits in terms of deployment speed, auditability, repeatability, benefits that we need when we consider the level of scale and complexity that we have to manage now compared to a few years ago. For those of you that aren't familiar with a declarative approach, a quick second on that. It is a lot more streamlined than the traditional imperative approach to CICD, as you can see. If we're doing things declaratively, we just specify what we want the end result of something to be. Whereas with imperative, we have to specify how to get that end result. So in the context of deployments, if we're implementing CICD the imperative way, we write a script that orchestrates every step that needs to happen. Call this admin API, extract that token, use it to call this API, add the policies with that API, and so on. This is a pain to first set up. It is a pain to debug if something goes wrong, and it's a pain to rewrite if and when one of the underlying admin APIs changes. But if we're doing it the declarative way, we don't need to worry about any of that. We just tell the platform what it needs to look like when that API has been deployed, and the platform itself takes care of how that's achieved. This simplicity is why every deployment approach nowadays is declarative. And the same is true in API ops. The beauty here is that we shouldn't even need to write that declarative config file ourselves. In tools like Kong, we can automatically generate it from the API spec so we can have it instantly. And because it's generated from the spec, it'll be completely accurate and consistent with the spec. So we know that nothing will be forgotten about and there's no chance of human error in that deployment process. So that declarative configuration, having been automatically generated as part of the pipeline, instructs the API platform what it needs to look like once the API has been deployed and the platform goes off and configures itself. So we end up with our API registered in the platform and with the various security, governance, and operational plugins for that API configured as well. 
It's also worth noting that we store this declarative config in version control, along with the spec, the tests, and the implementation of the API. And this means that we have this complete searchable and auditable history of every deployment we've made. So if ever there's a problem once we've deployed an API, then we can very easily roll back to a previous state. So it's not just that we've made deployment easier, but rollbacks as well. Of course, once we've deployed the API, we need to validate that it performs how we expect and check that we haven't caused any errors. We're now in an environment where other APIs and codes been deployed, so we should do some integration testing, security testing, performance testing, whatever's appropriate depending on where you're at in your software development lifecycle. So we'll run this series of release checks before we actually publish this API and make it discoverable. And these checks should also all be automated, although some people may still want that final sign off as a manual step before you push that publish button. But when you do, to publish it, registering it in the portal, enabling self-serve access and adding the spec to the portal for the API should be an automated process as well. After all, the only way to actually guarantee that every API is discoverable and documented in the portal is to automate that publishing. Now, what we've built up as we've gone through the API lifecycle is this inventory of assets that enable us to operate this API on an ongoing basis in an almost entirely self-sufficient way. If we need to scale out the API to handle higher throughput, then that can be completely automated using the declarative config. Since it is version controlled, we'll see a completely repeatable, identical deployment to before. The overall result here, when our API lifecycles follow API ops, is that this continuous automated testing and deployment means that we catch and resolve errors and deviations from our standards early, speeding up deployment and raising quality and consistency. Acme have just adopted API ops, and in the mortgages team, Emily's working on another API. As before, she's following best practice by doing this design first. But unlike before, the tool she's using to create her design gives her instant feedback on it, so she can make sure herself that the spec she's building doesn't violate any policies. She skipped out several days of back and forth with the API platform team getting this right. Instead, it takes her just a few minutes herself. And then once her spec meets standards, she has the ability to push it directly into Git so that it triggers the next part of the automated API ops pipeline. This creates a pull request in Git for the API platform team to then review and decide whether to approve a merger into the code base or reject it like before and send it back to Emily for more work. Life is very different now in the API platform team. They've automated the API review process and they've applied it to every single API coming in for review. So they've got 100% coverage of every quality, security and compliance check across every single API being built at Acme. Their QA costs have gone way down and they're no longer the bottleneck for APIs being deployed. If there was a problem in Emily's spec, she wouldn't have to wait for the next scheduled review session because these automated reviews are triggered whenever a new API has been submitted. This time, there weren't any issues with Emily's spec. The tool she used at design time made it easy for her to do the right thing from the beginning. So the chances of her API meeting standards now is much higher. So once these automated tests have passed, the last step is the automatic generation of the declarative config from the spec. This is then added to Git and picked up by the operations team. Not that they really have to do much. The API platform configures itself based on the declarative config, right? It registers the endpoints and it applies and configures all of the necessary plugins as well. So no more forgetting the security. The platform also automatically makes the endpoint discoverable in Acme's portal. So Emily's API is deployed immediately and smoothly. And deployment's much more likely to go smoothly with API ops because everything has been tested, so the chance of introducing problems is lower. 
And also the deployment is completely automated and declarative. In fact, deployments are now so repeatable that the ops team have removed their limit of one a week. They are now deploying in a truly continuous fashion and they can meet the increasing demands as API adoption accelerates across Atom. Of course, there'll still be times when things go wrong. That is unavoidable. But the impact of something going wrong is now much easier for the team to minimize. Since every version of each declarative config is in version control, we have a complete history of every deployment. And since these files are all declarative, it's really easy to just revert back to a previous state. The operations team just needs to feed in one of the previous configurations to the platform and it'll revert itself back. Things are quite different for API consumers now too. Through API Ops, we're ensuring that every API is consistently discoverable, documented, secured, and reliable. And this means that Acme's portal is now a thing of beauty. It's a catalog of products where each product is a well-designed API. All of this means that Acme can now operate at pace without lowering delivery quality. In fact, they're increasing quality whilst reducing costs, which means that they've got much more resource to innovate than they could before. So they get to constantly deliver new capabilities and experiences to their customers. This is the power of API ops, and it's not just open to companies like Acme. Every single organization can automate the API lifecycle like this, if you have the right API tooling and the right API first mindset. Thank you very much. We've got a few minutes left for uh, Q&A and I'll hang around in the chat as well. Thank you so Thank much you. for that wonderful presentation, Melissa. I think we learned a lot from you. So a couple of questions for you. The first one is companies have been adopting APIs for a long time. So why is now the time for API ops? Great question. I get asked that one a lot. Uh, the way I think about things is the API economy, API management, the world that we're in, we built years and years ago, right? That's like the API economy 1.0. We're now in the API economy 2.0. The problems, the requirements, the use cases that we used to have even a handful of years ago were very, very different to nowadays. APIs used to be you know, exposing a handful of RESTful APIs externally, making sure they're discoverable in a portal, and that would kind of be it, not a huge amount of change. But now we've got um, on-premise data centers, we've got serverless and Kubernetes, hundreds or thousands of them. We've got everything in between. We've got more and more federated teams working in different patterns, and we've got more teams depending on APIs. So the uh, speed with which we need to produce APIs and the consistency with which we need to deliver them is so much more important than before. And it's not like we're getting significantly bigger teams to be able to handle that level of scale. So we've just got to automate it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. I think, you know, as you're just responding to that last question, you know, another thought that I just had was, you know, just in terms of shifting the culture, you know, within organizations to even be able to embrace some of the, these shifts that are happening, you know, what effective practices or recommendations would you give for folks to be able to do that? The, so the culture shift, the mindset shift, mindset shift is absolutely critical. It's pointless having the right technology in place if you're not going to use it to achieve APIs in the right way. Uh, all of the things that we've set up as best practices, evangelism, lunch and learns, hackathons, all of these are activities that we should be intentional about, but we should absolutely still do. And this is because it's you're bringing someone on an emotional journey, right? Change is an emotional trigger and change is scary. The unknown is scary. So we have to make sure that we identify early on who are going to be early champions that can be early adopters, try things out, and then they can evangelize their benefit. 
who's going to be the more difficult people that may require a little bit more nurturing that we need to make sure that we planned a good roadmap to spend the right time with them actually you know spend time in meetings in person back in the future when we can and actually just help them to make that change yeah well thank you so much for that response and thank you so much for your time today your session your presentation was really wonderful um and you know i think that for sure folks want to connect with you and so please do so in the chat and connect um we definitely look forward to you know continuing to hear all, about all the wonderful work that you're up to um thank you thank you again for being here today thank you so much shirley